Hi, this is Nurse Inga, and you're watching Assessment and Care of the Respiratory Patient. The respiratory system is responsible for ventilation, which is air movement, in combination with the cardiovascular system, which provides perfusion, blood flow, at the alveolar capillary level, so the process of external respiration or gas exchange can occur. The lungs is where gas exchange occurs based on adequate ventilation and perfusion. Cellular respiration or gas exchange inside the body occurs between the capillaries and the cells based on hydrostatic and oncotic pressures. In the normal or healthy lung tissue, blood circulates from the heart past the lungs and then out to the body. CO2 is blown off, O2 is picked up, and it's circulated out to the body. If there is a mismatch of ventilation and perfusion, we have two options. We can either have perfusion without ventilation, such as the blockage or damage to an alveolus, and blood will go by, but unable to pick up oxygen, or we can have ventilation without perfusion, such as in the case of a PE or some sort of uh, poor perfusion or shock, and therefore air can go in and out, but blood does not go by. When performing a history of the respiratory system, a thorough history, including risk factors for respiratory disease is important to uncover the need for further evaluation or testing. A patient who reports things like coughing, nasal or sinus symptoms, pain, discolored mucus, blood from the mouth or nose, dyspnea at any point in time, fatigue or unexplained weight loss should receive a closer evaluation. A patient with a respiratory complaint who experiences limitations in speaking, use of accessory muscles or retractions, has adventitious breath sounds, tachypnea or bradypnea with altered mental status, hypoxia or cyanosis, should be considered an emergency and referred for immediate medical care. For infants and pediatrics, being exposed to secondhand smoke is part of the assessment, as well as feeding and sleeping habits. The sudden unexplained death of an infant, or SIDS, is most common during sleep, up to six months of age, and is di a diagnosis of exclusion, which means that we rule out other possibilities, such as congenital defects, suffocation, injury, etc. Begin with asking about the current complaints. What are your signs and symptoms? When did they start? Is there anything that makes them better or worse? And that includes meds that they've taken. Tell me what it feels like to you. Where is it that you're feeling this? Does it go anywhere else? How severe is this for you? How is it impacting your life? Do you feel it all day long or does it come and go? Is it worse in the morning? Is it worse at night? What do you think is going on? And then review their past medical history and make sure that you understand. Have you ever used any tobacco products? Do you still? Tell me about your drug use history. Do you have any allergies to any medications? Any allergies to environmental or food? What medications do you take? Are there any that you should be taking that you can't afford or are not taking? What over-the-counter medications or herbal preps do you take? Anything for sleep? Any eye drops or nasal sprays? What past medical history have you had? Things that you've been treated for, hospitalized for, surgical procedures? Tell me about your family history. Have you traveled outside of the country? What do you do for work? Where do you live? Really what you're trying to gather is what kind of exposures have they had that could impact their respiratory health? During your assessment, consider the impact that lack of oxygen or work of breathing has on the body. Is the person fatigued? Have they developed a barrel-shaped chest and or clubbing? Do you know any abnormal work of breathing or mentation? Is the airway patent? In an infant, an accumulation of mucus in the nares can cause respiratory distress that can be relieved simply by suctioning the nose. Pay close attention to the rate, depth, and effort 
as well as the number of words the person can speak. Look at the skin color and put the whole picture together. While inspecting the neck and the thorax, also palpate those areas for any abnormal findings. Palpate the skin for temperature and moisture. Palpate pulses. Tachycardia may be a sign of hypoxia. Consider age-related changes that would be normal for the patient, such as pediatrics that have large tongues and narrow airways, short and straight use station tubes, and immature immune systems. They are obligate nose breathers. Older adults have stiffening of the rib cage. Kyphosis, lordosis, scoliosis are more common. They have a decrease in chest wall compliance. The diaphragm and intercostal muscles lose strength. The tissues are less elastic, and there's an increase in the potential for bronchospasm. Gas exchange is impaired due to decreased cough reflex and decreased response to changes in CO2 and O2. Chronic inflammation of the lung tissue is more common as we age. As you enter the room or first interact with the patient, just look at their overall general impression. What is their muscle tone? their posture, their appearance, their mental status. Look at the patency of the airway, the nares. Look at their neck and their trachea. Is it midline? Is it symmetrical? Observe the rate, the depth, and the effort of breathing, the shape of the thorax. Look at the skin color. Check the turgor, the mucous membranes. Look at the nails again for clubbing or the fingers for tobacco staining. Palpate the trachea. Make sure it's midline, and then palpate the thorax for things like crepitus from either subcutaneous emphysema or fractures. Palpate for pain, any masses, deformities, and palpate for equal expansion. Oscillate for lung sounds. Develop a pattern for listening to lung sounds. Note that the upper lobes are best heard anteriorly, and the right middle lobe is heard anteriorly and laterally. The lower lobes are heard best posteriorly, and note the location of any abnormal sounds and whether they were present on inspiration, expiration, or both. Ask the patient to cough and reassess sounds like ronchi for clearing with coughing. Adventitious lung sounds are considered abnormal. However, they may be a normal finding for the patient with chronic disease. Strider is a high-pitched inspiratory sound of the upper airway, caused by airway obstruction, glottic edema, trauma, or spasms. It's found in croup, epiglottitis, laryngitis, allergic reactions, foreign body airway obstruction, and vocal cord injuries. Patients who've had thyroidectomy may develop strider after surgery from nerve injury or edema. Ronchi is a low-pitched, junky, or snoring sound from thick mucus in the upper and large airways. It can be heard with inspiration and exhalation and often clears, at least partially, with coughing. Conditions like COPD, pneumonia, bronchitis, foreign bodies, and tumors may cause ronchi. Wheezes are musical, violin-like sounds in the smaller airways due to bronchoconstriction, the bronchioles, mucosal edema, and excessive mucus production. They can be present on exhalation, both exhalation and inhalation, or just inhalation. And those are listed in order of getting worse. Be careful to note when you hear them, as the person is getting worse, as you hear them on inspiration only, and as they get softer. Wheezes are present with asthma, COPD, and allergic reactions. Crackles are fine, soft like hair rubbing together, or coarse, slightly louder popping sounds. From recruitment of atelectic alveoli or fluid in the alveoli or terminal bronchioles. Monitor the location, dependent, or how high, and if they clear with deep breathing, like atelectasis. Conditions like hypoventilation, bronchitis, pneumonia, COPD, pulmonary edema, and congestive heart failure 
can all lead to crackles. Diagnostic assessment of the respiratory system includes evaluating gas exchange, oxygen, and CO2 levels. Non-invasive diagnostic techniques include pulse oximetry, which estimates the amount of hemoglobin in the red blood cells that are bound to oxygen. However, there are many conditions that lead to false readings, such as blue or metallic nail polish, cold or poor perfused fingers, movement, and direct sunlight. End tidal CO2 can be measured by colometric or waveform devices that measure the amount of exhaled CO2. Again, this is an estimated level and requires adequate ventilation and perfusion for respiration to occur. Blood gases are a more accurate measurement of gas levels and acid-base balance, but are invasive. Allen's test should be performed prior to puncturing the radial artery to ensure blood flow to the hand. Pressure is held for several minutes after the arterial puncture to avoid bleeding. Respiratory acidosis is the most common acid-base imbalance from the respiratory system. We see it in COPD, it's a late finding in pneumonia, and we see it with ARDS. It's caused primarily by hypoventilation and respiratory failure. Respiratory alkalosis is the other acid-base imbalance, and it is caused primarily by hyperventilation. We see this with early asthma or pneumonia, where the patient increases their respiratory rate to compensate for hypoxia, and it's also seen with anxiety. Sputum analysis can confirm infection, the organism, and the sensitivity. Chest x-rays can identify problems with the heart, the lungs, and the pleural space. Masses, fluid, or air collections in the pleural space are easily seen on chest x-ray, as well as pneumonia, atelectasis, and tuberculosis. Pulmonary function testing evaluates lung function and helps evaluate if a disease such as COPD is stabilizing or progressing. More invasive interventions and diagnostics are sometimes required when there's a problem with the respiratory system. Thoracentesis is used to evacuate fluid from the pleural space. Fluid can be collected and sent to the lab for evaluation. The patient is awake and sitting upright, bent forward to open the spaces between the ribs. The provider uses a local anesthetic to numb the area, but the patient may feel pressure or slight stinging pain. The nurse should ensure consent is signed beforehand, remain with the patient and monitor vital signs and respiratory status, and educate the patient about the risks and when to call. Those would include tachycardia, tachypnea, palpita palpitations, and respiratory distress or chest pain if they're discharged the same day. Monitor the site for bleeding or infection after puncture. Hypotension any time more than 500 milliliters are evacuated and pneumothorax from direct trauma to the lung are both possible. The nurse should monitor vital signs carefully during and after the procedure, and it's common to receive a chest x-ray after the procedure to rule out pneumothorax. Bronchoscopy is using a scope to look or evaluate the bronchial tract. A flexible bronchoscopy can be done at the bedside with um, moderate sedation to obtain a biopsy or change out an ET tube. Your rigid bronchoscopy is done in the OR under general anesthesia to remove obstructions or large amounts of mucus from the respiratory tract. A lung biopsy can be performed to analyze tissue to assess for infection or malignancy. This can be done at the bedside using moderate sedation and inserting a needle through the skin, um, usually ultrasound guided, or under general anesthesia in the OR, which requires a chest tube afterwards to reinflate the lung. Anyone who receives sedation should be NPO for eight hours ahead of time to reduce the risk of aspiration and should remain NPO until their gag reflex has returned following the procedure. Management of the patient with a chest tube includes maintaining a closed system,
so not allowing any of the tubes to become disconnected. Keep the collection system below the level of the chest. Frequent respiratory assessment at least every two to four hours is important. Check the tubes for kinks or loops. There should not be any dependent loops. Check the water seal chamber for bubbling. Initially, there's bubbling on exhalation indicating reinflation of the lung, then tidaling or fluctuation in the water level with respiration that decreases as the pleura heals. Vigorous or continuous bubbling in the water seal chamber is a sign of a leak. Check all of the tubing and connections first. Measure the amount of drainage. This is part of your INO measurements that you do every shift. Never clamp the chest tube. Assist with frequent position changes, ambulation, pain management, turn, cough, deep breathe. Apply an occlusive dressing at the time of removal or if the chest tube is accidentally dislodged. We can divide problems with respiratory patients into airway or ventilation issues, breathing or respiration issues, and circulation or perfusion issues. So let's begin by discussing air issues. In assessing and managing the airway, the first thing you want to think about is the airway open and patent, and is the patient able to maintain it on their own? If not, do you need to reposition the airway, like head tilt chin lift, for a medical patient or jaw thrust for a trauma patient? If the tongue is falling back in the throat due to altered mental status, does the patient require an oral airway? If they don't have a gag reflex or a nasal airway, if they do have a gag reflex, are they going to require long-term airway management and ventilation, and therefore an ET tube should be placed? BiPAP, CPAP, or AutoPAP can be used to support the patient with intermittent airway obstruction, such as sleep apnea, or who requires increased airway pressures like COPD exacerbation or heart failure. The masks and straps of the CPAP need to fit really snugly to avoid leaks, and so sometimes these devices can cause anxiety. The patient should use relaxation techniques or sometimes even require small doses of benzodiazepines, such as Ativan, to tolerate the mask. The air can be humidified to prevent drying and irritation of the airways. If there are adventitious sounds, their way is not patent. Snoring indicates a partial obstruction by the tongue. Positioning, like a head tilt chin lift, and or insertion of an oral airway will alleviate this. Gurgling occurs when secretions, such as saliva, vomit, or blood, accumulate in the posterior pharynx. Thick secretions, like thick vomit, should be removed with a finger sweep. Turn the head to the side or roll the patient on their side, allow gravity to help it drain out and sweep it out. Thin secretions can be suctioned out. Suction with a Yankauer, which is a rigid suction catheter. Insert it to the posterior pharynx, occlude the hole, and start suctioning in a circular motion on the way out for no more than 10 seconds. If repeat suctioning is required, you should wait 20 to 30 seconds to reoxygenate the patient if the patient can breathe. Um, if the patient's airway is completely obstructed by vomit, continue suctioning until the airway is clear, and then follow up with oxygenation and continued assessment. Strider is present when a foreign body infection or inflammation occurs at the level of the glottis, so the vocal cords. If a foreign body is suspected and the person can cough, speak, or breathe, encourage them to cough. If they cannot cough, speak, or breathe, initiate back blows and chest thrusts on an infant or abdominal thrust for a child or an adult. If the victim is unresponsive, initiate CPR. Blind finger sweeps are not done at any age anymore. Only sweep an object out of the mouth that you can visualize. If the patient is experiencing mucus, mucus plugs, or um, thick or heavy secretions, adding hydration, suction, mucolytics, encouraging turn cough, deep breathe, incentive spirometer, chest physiotherapy, and positioning will all help clear those secretions. A tracheostomy is an artificial airway created in the trachea to allow for long-term mechanical ventilation or to decrease the work of breathing in certain patients with chronic disease. It can also be used in patients following laryngectomy for laryngeal cancer. There are um, some basic steps to uh, providing care for the patient who has a tracheostomy.
Um, and so they go in order. You're going to take care of the inner cannula, the stoma, the dressing, the ties, and then document it. So just to talk about that a little more in detail, the first thing you're going to do is assemble all of your equipment, identify yourself and the patient, explain the purpose of your interaction. If the cuff of the tracheostomy tube is inflated, the patient will likely not be able to speak. So use alternative methods of communication, such as eye blinking, hand squeezing, nodding, pen and paper, dry erase boards, picture boards, iPads, tablets, electronic devices, signing if they can sign, um, et cetera. Perform hand hygiene and observe universal precautions and provide privacy. Prepare the patient. Typically, semi-fowlers or fowlers will be the most comfortable and then prepare your equipment at the bedside. You have already assessed your patient, but assess the need for suction. And this includes um, ronquorous breath sounds. Are they able to take a deep breath? We only suction if indicated. If you do need to suction, you're gonna use sterile gloves. You're only gonna suction on the way out, no more than 10 seconds. And again, allowing 20 to 30 seconds in between passes with the suction catheter uh, for oxygenation. Flush the catheter with sterile water before you suction to test the device. And again, in between suction passes or attempts um, to kind of flush the catheter out and clean it out. We do not put saline or water down the tracheostomy or the trach tube unless you have a specific order from the physician. This practice of irrigating the tracheostomy while it's in the patient has been shown to increase the risk of infection and aspiration. It's critical that the patient receive oxygen prior to suction, so pre-oxygenation helps prevent hypoxia, as well as oxygen after suctioning to re-oxygenate the patient. Remove the inner cannula and either dispose of and replace it with a, um, or clean, inspect, dry, and replace it. So take it out, clean it or throw it away, and then uh, put a new one or the old one back in. Ensure it's really secured in place so it click locks in, make sure it's in there all the way. Remove now the soil dressing and gently cleanse around the stoma and the flange of the tube, so kind of the outer opening of the tube. You can use normal saline for this. Remove all of the crusts uh, very, very gently. Again, you don't want to pull on the tube. You don't want to manipulate it or move it around a lot as that can be very irritating for the stoma, especially if it's a fresh tracheostomy. Dry the skin very gently. Um, don't, you know, no aggressive like rubbing, um, but you do want to make sure it's dry so that you don't create like an environment that uh, wants to, you know, become macerated or, or grow yeast. And then replace with a sterile dressing. Never cut a groove in a dressing as the fibers then become loose and they can be inhaled or get into the wound, um, but use a, a pre-manufactured, like, you know, um, trach uh, gauze that they actually have some really neat ones that are kind of um, padded and really gentle on the skin or um, there's actually a folding method that you can use to take a four by four and turn it into kind of a V. Change the trach ties next. These should be snug enough to hold, um, kind of hold the device in place while loose enough to be able to fit two fingers underneath. The Velcro ones tend to be less irritating to the skin. Um, if you do tie them, a lot of people like to uh, pad underneath with uh, two by twos or four by fours and then just kind of tape those in place underneath the ties themselves so that the ties don't irritate the skin. And then when you have finished all of this, reassess and document the procedure and the patient's response and how they tolerated it. If you are changing the trach or performing trach care on a pediatric patient, just a consideration, um, you may need an assistant to keep an active child from accidentally dislodging the tube during care. And it's important to include parents whenever possible so that they can you know, calm the child, work with the child, but also so that they can learn how to take care of the trach at home. So moving on to some infectious processes, um, infants and children with fevers from uh, viral or bacterial infections are really at risk for dehydration. So things like URIs, um, you know, sinus infections, um, uh, strep throat or tonsillitis can really impact their fluid balances, um, especially if they have a fever, they're tachypneic, or if they're mouth breathing. 
one of the big things that we really work with parents on is the um, uh, pushing fluids and for infants especially that could just mean frequent small sips drops or even like you know pops right so uh, popsicles you know droppers full of breast milk or formula uh, or just you know sips or spoonfuls of something um, to help keep the child hydrated uh, suctioning the nose just prior to feeding can help the child relax and improve feedings Upper respiratory tract infections typically start out as viral. We can also have like allergic rhinitis or viral uh, rhinosinusitis. Those are usually best treated with things like saline to kind of loosen and um, lessen the secretions, intranasal steroids for the older children to decrease inflammation, um, antihistamines and decongestants for older children to kind of uh, dry up the um, secretions. Acute bacterial rhinal sinusitis occurs when they have had more than 10 days of symptoms or new symptoms after five to six days. So they suddenly develop like headache or facial pain after five or six days of having kind of these viral symptoms or acute symptoms that last for more than three to four days. Then we would treat that with antibiotics because we would soon assume that they either have a bacterial infection or they developed a bacterial infection on top of their viral infection. Pharyngitis and tonsillitis, so I'm kind of moving down the upper airway a little bit. Pharyngitis is kind of a sore throat, tonsillitis is inflamed tonsils. These oftentimes go hand in hand. They can be viral or bacterial, or even from irritation from something like an inhaler. Um, but uh, you know, the worst case scenario kind of is that strep throat um, or some sort of an abscess. And so we always like to culture these just to make sure that it's not strep. And then oftentimes we're pretty aggressive in treating these um, because they're such a common pediatric problem, but we're worried about strep throat that can cause rheumatic fever and rheumatic heart disease. And I think that research is showing that that probably isn't as prevalent as we once thought it was. And there is a trend kind of shifting away from such aggressive antibiotic treatment um, of uh, strep pharyngitis. Um, so stay tuned, that practice is kind of changing. Uh, tonsillitis occurs when the lymphatic tissue is inflamed. Um, and this oftentimes goes kind of hand in hand with uh, pharyngitis itself. Uh, but if it becomes a chronic uh, problem or if the child, if it never really resolves and the child's having chronic issues, an ear, nose and throat or ENT doc uh, might take these out and that's called a tonsillectomy. Um, after the procedure, uh, it's important for us to really monitor the airway. Um, no PO uh, fluids until the gag reflex has returned. And then you want to monitor for bleeding. And you can look in the airway to monitor for bleeding. But really, the other thing is if it's a posterior bleed, because you know this is kind of the back of the throat that's bleeding, um, you'll notice frequent swallowing because they're actually swallowing that blood. Don't feed them anything red, brown, or kind of blood colored so that if they do vomit, you have um, that kind of assessment tool where you can look at it and determine what color the vomit is. Other upper airway disorders, so like kind of non-infectious disorders would be obstructive sleep apnea. So um, we treat that with CPAP, which we talked about, weight loss and surgery. Um, those are kind of options um, to uh, open the airway. Uh, using a CPAP does not reverse the damage that's done by obstructive sleep apnea, but um, not treating obstructive sleep apnea increases the risk of um, heart disease and heart attacks. Laryngitis can be infectious, but it also is oftentimes inflammatory. So um, postnasal drip is one of the common causes, but also GERD and then smoking or irritation from things like you know, tobacco and alcohol. Um, it's important when you're thinking about the risk factors for laryngitis and the management of laryngitis that um, you also think about screening for cancer. Uh, laryngeal cancer presents very similar to laryngitis, but the symptoms last for more than two weeks and things like GERD and toxin exposures, but also smoking and tobacco are kind of high on the list of risk factors for uh, laryngeal cancer. So if someone had persistent laryngitis or hoarseness for more than two weeks, they would need additional testing.
and the treatment for both of those is primarily symptomatic laryngeal cancer if they did have uh, cancer would be you know surgery um, the you know laryngectomy as we talked about and then uh, tracheostomy um, and uh, communication management and nutrition management things like that afterwards um, but uh, otherwise it's kind of symptomatic so if it's a GERD issue we treat the GERD and if it's a smoking issue we treat the smoking and you know so on Group syndromes are uh, kind of a group of uh, syndromes that are lumped together that all present with this brassy or kind of barking, creepy cough and strider. Um, the most common one that we see is the laryngotracheobronchitis, which would we refer to as croup. Uh, and um, children typically get this in like the winter to springtime, usually. Uh, younger kids um, under the age of six, they grow out of it. Um, it's uh, worse at night and uh, gets better um, with like a steam shower and then going out in the cold. Uh, and basically it's just edema from a viral infection. Again, because it's strider, it's kind of in that glottic area. Care is mainly supportive. Hydration, um, saline or humidifying cool mist nebs. Um, if it's really bad, we could do racemic epinephrine and then uh, steroids as well. Bronchiolitis and RSV <clears throat> are actually uh, kind of uh, start off as um, a upper airway thing, but then leads to um, a lower airway inflammation. So it's kind of a viral URI that leads to a lower airway um, viral infection with wheezing and dyspnea. There is a vaccine available for RSV and an antiviral treatment, the ribavirin, but that is a teratogen and no one who's pregnant can be in the room while the child is receiving the nebulized um, antiviral treatment. It's usually done inside like a tent. Um, pregnant caregivers can't uh, take care of these children. Uh, if they're receiving that medication and mom or visitors can't be pregnant and in the room. Um, acute epiglottitis is technically not a croup syndrome, but oftentimes kind of lumped together. This usually occurs in older kids. Um, and this is a, just a bacterial inflammation of the epiglottis itself. The person usually pre presents with kind of a tripod or leaning forward position they um, stick their chin up and out and put themselves in the sniffing position to try to open the airway. Um, they can't swallow, so they're drooling. And typically the voice sounds very muffled. It is an acute onset because it's bacterial and uh, it's treated with antibiotics. It is truly an emergency because they could lose their airway at any point in time. So everything should be set up and ready to go for both intubation and um, you know, a surgical crike or tracheostomy at the bedside. Uh, nothing in the mouth or the throat. Uh, if you cause irritation and stimulate that uh, gag reflex, you could actually cause laryngospasm and completely obstruct the airway. So as um, a provider, it's not your responsibility to be uh, visualizing the throat or the airway. Um, leave that to the person who can actually intubate. Influenza is a viral infection of the respiratory tract. It's spread through um, droplet. And so the person needs to be on precautions. Antiviral agents are effective if they're started within 24 to 48 hours of onset of the symptoms. And that they can decrease the severity of symptoms and shorten the duration by one day. Uh, the biggest concern really is development of a secondary infection. Uh, people can become severely dehydrated. And um, the elderly, the young, and the immunocompromised are also at risk for things like pneumonia. So watch for those signs and symptoms, so that lingering cough or nighttime cough, fever after seeming to get better, lack of energy, lack of appetite, um, any new signs or symptoms after they initially um, looked like they were getting better. And um, let's talk about some lower airway disorders that impact airflow. So things below the glottis 
alveolar ventilation and um, kind of gas change. When you're assessing breathing and managing breathing for patients, think about the respiratory rate. Is it too fast or too slow based on the age? Also consider their current condition. Are they in pain? Are they afraid? Do they have a fever? Are they asleep or really active? And are there any medications that you gave them that could, that could impact their rate of respirations? Look at the depth. Is it normal? Is it deep? Is it shallow? Um, and does the depth or the rate fluctuate or is it constant? So pattern breathing such as chain stokes gives you that kind of rapid, deep, followed by slow, shallow um, patterned breathing. So really it's important to count for a full minute to see patterns. And also look at the effort. Um, is it normal effort, increased effort, or decreased effort? And decreased effort with altered mental status is an ominous sign of uh, respiratory in uh, failure and impending respiratory arrest. And then lastly, are there any adventitious sounds? Patients who are breathing too slowly or shallowly or who had increased effort and now have decreased effort with signs of altered mental status need ventilatory assistance, like a bag valve mask. Initial bag valve mask can be at room air because the goal really is just to get air into the alveoli and exchange gas. And once then you have like enough, um, you know, manpower, uh, or the oxygen is there, go ahead and attach the bag valve mask to the oxygen, but that's not as critical as just getting ventilations into the patient. Consider the whole patient and the lung sounds in the clinical decision making. How sick really is this person? Hypoventilation leads to respiratory acidosis and hyperventilation leads to respiratory alkalosis, and then each one of those has associated signs and symptoms. So if the patient's hyperventilating, they're going to have numbness and tingling in their you know, hands and feet and maybe even in their face. Monitor breath sounds frequently for changes and think about the progression of the patient. Does the change indicate an improvement or a decline in their condition? For example, decreased wheezing could signal either improvement if the child has increased air movement and decreased work of breathing, or it could signal a decline in their condition if there's decreased air movement and signs of hypoxia or respiratory failure. So let's talk about some of our lower airway problems. Um, asthma. Asthma is a reactive airway disease that's defined as intermittent and reversible airway obstruction that's caused by an exaggerated immune response with resulting smooth muscle constriction. There's inflammation, edema, bronchoconstriction, and mucus production. And this decreases the internal diameter of the airways, leading to air trapping and a prolonged expiratory phase and wheezing. It really think of asthma as an inflammatory response and it's cumulative of all the exposures that the person's had in the last seven days. And it can really exacerbate quickly when exposed to a strong allergen stimulus, such as cigarette smoke, mold, pollen, animal dander, roaches, air pollutants, occupational irritants, and dust or illness. Uh, viral infections, bacterial infections, as well as allergic responses lead to an increase in inflammation and edema and can set off this inflammatory response. Nasal polyps are also on the list of things that can trigger asthma attacks because they're part of what we call this allergic triad, and that's people who have asthma, nasal polyps, and then this aspirin allergy. Food and drug allergies and even emotional responses can trigger an asthma attack. Control medications should be taken daily, and rescue medications uh, such as short-acting um, beta agonists or bronchodilators are used for asthma exacerbation. Ensure the patient has a rescue inhaler and a spacer and knows how to use them. Chronic bronchitis is a chronic inflammation of the bronchi and goblet cells, leading to narrowing of the airways and thick mucus production. Emphysema is damage to the alveolar walls that leads to a loss of elasticity and decreased gas exchange. Air trapping in the damaged alveoli is common. Both chronic bronchitis and emphysema are forms of chronic obstructive pulmonary disease or COPD. And it's possible to have you know, some of both at the same time. Chronic bronchitis tends to be thought of as kind of the initial phase and emphysema tends to be thought of more as end stage COPD. Treatment for COPD includes bronchodilators, mucolytics, steroidal anti-inflammatories, and then oxygen is needed to maintain a normal saturation. And we kind of gauge that based on mental status. 
So for the population that does not have COPD, we may say oxygen to maintain a SAT of 94%. However, some patients who have COPD have kind of burnt out their CO2 receptors and they operate truly on a hypoxic drive. Therefore, we refer to them as CO2 retainers. And high concentration or high flow O2 over long periods of time can actually cause hypoventilation and respiratory acidosis. Therefore, we don't really try to give them an O2 SAT of 94%. Oftentimes, we'll give them an O2 SAT of or target range of 88 to 92% based on how well they tolerate that. Can they do activity at that saturation? You know, is their mental status normal at that saturation? How do they tolerate that? Use oxygen appropriately really is the key and be prepared to provide ventilations to someone who's hypoxic and hypoventilating. So if you have a patient who appears to be in respiratory distress and they're hypoxic and they need oxygen, give them the oxygen, but watch them because you may end up having to ventilate them as well. Watch for signs and symptoms of hypoxia. Bronchodilators such as albuterol work by stimulating the sympathetic nervous system so that fight or flight response. If the patient's tachycardic from hypoxia, the heart rate may actually slow down with administration of albuterol. However, if the patient's using the short-acting bronchodilator as a control medication, they may actually experience tachycardia as a side effect. Look for other signs such as increased work of breathing, decreased word count, accessory muscle use, positioning, purse lip breathing, and changes in skin color and condition. And watch for signs and symptoms of pneumonia or infection, such as lack of appetite, back pain, fever or chills, increasing shortness of breath, a change in the sputum from white to yellow, or an increased productive cough. Patients with COPD should be seen as soon as possible for possible infections, given their risk for impaired gas exchange and their increased risk for infection. Cystic fibrosis is an autosomal recessive genetic disorder that impairs chloride transport, and it results in these thick, tenacious secretions in the respiratory tract, the sweat glands, the GI tract and pancreas, and reproductive secretions. The person with uh, CEF typically has like this really salty skin and sweat. They get frequently constipated. Uh, but when they do go, they have steatorrhea, which are these bulky, frothy, foul-smelling stools. And uh, infants are prone to meconium ileus. And it's because the uh, mucus within the GI tract is so thick. These thick GI secretions also plug up the pancreas, causing uh, pancreatic failure and requiring pancreatic enzyme replacement therapy with food. The respiratory secretions are really difficult for cystic fibrosis patients to clear, and that leads to increased risk of infection. We treat this with things like bronchodilators, mucolytics, and chest physiotherapy with postural drainage. If the person develops any signs or symptoms of an infection, antibiotics should be started right away. Lung cancer is most commonly related to smoking. A biopsy can be done to determine the type of cancer. There's small cell cancer and non-small cell lung cancer. Small cell cancer has the poorest outcome due to rapid metastases. Goals include things like smoking cessation, knowledge and education about the disease, and treatment includes surgery, chemotherapy, and radiation. Pneumonia occurs when there's an infection within the lung tissue. Place the person in the position of comfort and allow them to rest and monitor their vital signs. Respiratory isolation is sometimes indicated if the person has a fever or cough or if the pneumonia is related to influenza or MRSA. Cluster your care so that they can rest. Provide humidified oxygen to help keep the secretions liquefied and encourage hydration. Antipyretics and analgesics can be used for fever and pain, antibiotics to treat the infection, and bronchodilators to help dilate the bronchi and thin the secretions. Monitor the respiratory status and the condition frequently. Tuberculosis is another type of infection that occurs within the lung tissue. 
And this is tested for by using a, a PPD or a MANTU test, which is the purified protein derivative given intradermally, or um, a blood test, which is called quantiferon gold. If uh, these are positive, we confirm with a chest X-ray, and then treatment is based on the risk and the PPD size. The patient is placed on four medications for two months, and then two medications, the isoniazid and rifampin, for four more months. It's really critical that they take the entire course of medications to prevent drug-resistant TB and to completely clear the infection. We need to discuss liver complications with patients and monitor their blood work. Rifampin turns secretions red-orange, and we're attempting to monitor for jaundice, so labs are really important. Patients who complain of appetite, uh, loss, fatigue, chest pain, hemoptysis, especially nighttime coughing and sweats, productive prolonged coughing, um, and pallor who have any risk factors for tuberculosis should be screened. So lastly on our list is circulation. Certain conditions can impact blood flow through the pulmonary vessels, impacting the ability of the respiratory system to perform gas exchange. Pulmonary emboli or a pulmonary embolus is um, a blood clot that has traveled usually from the lower extremities like a DVT up through the inferior vena cava, through the right atrium to the right ventricle, and then out the pulmonary artery to the lungs where it gets wedged in one of the pulmonary vessels, like an artery or an arteriole, and then cuts off blood supply to a portion of the lung where there's no longer any blood going past the alveoli in that area. This creates what we call a VQ mismatch. There's, even though there's oxygen going out, there's ventilation, there's no perfusion. Common signs and symptoms are pleuritic chest pain, dyspnea, tachypnea, and hypoxia. We also often see nonspecific T wave changes on our EKG. So it's not a STEMI, but we might see some flipped T's. Pulmonary emboli, especially if they're large, can be fatal. If you have a patient with a DVT or a known PE who suddenly complains of chest pain or dyspnea, it's important that you assess them immediately. If there's any signs of hypoxia or tachycardia, call for help. Anticoagulants are used to prevent the clot from growing or further clots from forming. And this would include Lovenox or heparin and then you know, transitioning the patient over to Coumadin. An embolectomy is the surgical removal of a clot. Um, and that's usually done like at a vascular center. And patients at high risk may also have something like an IVC filter. So this looks kind of like a little umbrella that's placed in the inferior vena cava and that helps trap any future clots that are leaving lower extremities from ever reaching the lungs. Acute respiratory distress syndrome, or ARDS, is the overwhelming inflammatory response that leads to capillary leaking, massive fluid shifts into the alveoli and bronchioles with really progressive dyspnea and hypoxia, and that hypoxia persists despite aggressive oxygenation and or ventilation. We most commonly see ARDS after sepsis. It's also seen after things like pneumonia, overdoses, aspiration, and trauma. Treatment includes antibiotics in case there's any infection, steroids that decrease inflammation, and um, the kind of fibrotic remodeling that occurs with this inflammation, and then um, paralytics and sedation and pain management so that we can intubate them and mechanically ventilate them um, to have the best outcomes possible. ARDS has a really high mortality rate because as you can see from this chest X-ray, all of the fluid, um, the plasma, and all of you know the, the kind of the cells and the proteins and the antibodies that should be in the vascular space um, are now in between the alveoli and the capillaries or have crossed over the alveolar membrane and now are inside the alveoli and the bronchioles and gas exchange is not occurring at all, but it's also causing this like widespread immune reaction within the lung tissue itself, um, leading to 
just you know, kind of chronic um, irreversible damage. So even if you can reverse the fluid, there's still this long-term um, inflammation and uh, fibrotic damage that's occurring that's just really hard to overcome. Uh, typically, the patients who develop this are you know, uh, tremendously sick otherwise as well, and this usually becomes an overwhelming insult. They develop a respiratory acidosis from lack of uh, gas exchange and then a secondary metabolic acidosis from systemic um, lactic acid production from uh, cellular hypoxia. So last on the discussion is chest trauma. Um, so let's just start by saying, regardless of what occurs with the trauma, pain medication is critical for the chest trauma patient. Um, patients who sustain injuries to the chest tend to breathe very shallowly to avoid painful inspiration, and therefore they're not ventilating their alveoli. From the tip of your nose or mouth until you actually can exchange gas at the alveoli, there's about 150 milliliters of air that doesn't ever reach the alveoli um, and can't do anything. And we call this dead space or physiologic dead space. So therefore, if you take a breath that's shallower than 150 milliliters, you're actually not perfusing or exchanging gas at the alveolar level. So shallow respirations don't do us any good because they're not actually, you know, putting fresh air into the alveoli. They're not giving oxygen to the bloodstream and it's not actually like evacuating the CO2 from the body. Um, so some things to think about, rib fractures. Rib fractures are incredibly painful. Um, you can have like an isolated rib fracture uh, where um, it just, it hurts, but nothing underneath is damaged. There's no punctured lungs. It's not a flail segment. Um, you know, you've cracked a rib or two, uh, but only in one place, uh, and it just hurts. Um, those can take six to eight weeks to heal. Pain management really is the key, but teaching the person to, you know, splint the area, um, the importance of deep breathing to prevent pneumonia. You can have a flail chest where you have three or more ribs fractured in two or more places, which allows for this paradoxical movement of the chest wall. And that actually decreases the intrathoracic pressure, that vacuum that you create when the diaphragm contracts. So your inspiratory volume actually falls. Um, it's incredibly painful. And again, the person's gonna breathe more shallowly as well as losing that um, vacuum that they create that helps them breathe in the first place. So pain management and um, some passive splinting helps as well. We can have um, direct trauma to the lung tissue, penetrating trauma, or we can have you know, a rib fracture that punctures the lung, or we can just have spontaneous uh, pneumothorax where the lining or the layers of the lungs kind of separate and you can get air in the pleural space. So between those two, two layers of the, the lung lining, um, between the visceral and the parietal pleura, and that's called a pneumothorax. Or you can get blood in that space, and that's called a hemothorax. Or you can get air in blood, that's called a hemoneumothorax. Um, and you know we treat all that with a, a chest tube. So we, we hear that the person has decreased breath sounds, or we see that you know they're breathing kind of shallowly, or that their O2 sat is dropping, and we get a chest X-ray. We diagnose this hemothorax or pneumothorax. We put a chest tube in there, and we evacuate um, the air or the fluid out of there, and uh, you know they get better. The the problem with all of this is if they develop a tension pneumothorax. So that's what's pictured here. And that's when there's so much pressure built up on one side before we recognize it or, or alleviate it, that it actually starts to shift the mediastinum over um, to the uninjured side. And this causes compression of the heart. And we see jugular vein distension and a tracheal shift and tachycardia, hypoxia. Narrowing pulse pressure, which means that the diastolic and the systolic are getting closer together. Um, and this is caused by obstructive shock, hypotension, absent lung sounds on the affected side. Um, and you know the person will have a rapid decline in mental status. The rescue for this is needle chest decompression, followed by a chest tube insertion so that the lung can fully reinflate and heal. The thing to remember um, is, you know, that the sooner that you find it, 
the better the outcome will be for the patient. And if it's a hemothorax that we're treating and we're putting in a chest tube um, and evacuating blood out of that pleural space, it's critical then to monitor for the blood for our INOs um, how much we're losing and keep a careful eye on not only vital signs but also the patient's H and H to make sure that they're not losing so much blood that they may actually end up needing like a transfusion. So that is respiratory in a nutshell. Um, thank you as always for watching. I hope that you enjoyed this.